Number 10. No More Hands Margarita Grakova was married to a very evil man. Her marriage ended in a horrifying display of violence. Her extremely abusive husband kidnapped her, then chopped off both her hands with an axe. It happened in December of 2017. Her husband at the time, Dmitry Grakhev, drove her to an isolated part of a forest near their home in St. Petersburg, Russia. He then beat her with the blunt end of an axe, delivering over 40 blows across her body and leaving her half dead. As if beating her senseless wasn't enough, he then hacked off both her hands, leaving her horribly disfigured for the rest of her life. The only good thing was that it was cold outside. Her bones were pulverized and her flesh was ripped apart. But the cold kept her body and one of her severed hands well preserved. Doctors were miraculously able to reattach one of them, although she's not able to do much with it. These days, Margarita has a prosthetic on the end of her right arm that allows her to grab objects and make some subtle movements. Her husband, now ex-husband, is sitting in jail for the next 14 years, which most believe isn't long enough. Since the attack, Margarita has dedicated her life to protecting victims of domestic violence in Russia. She's even gotten herself a program on Russian TV to help bring the horrendous reality of what these evil men do into the spotlight. Number 9. Stone Cold Florida Killer Robert Kessler was arrested on drug charges, but now he's facing an additional charge of second-degree murder, as well as a charge for the abuse of a dead human body. His victim was identified as Stephanie Crone Overholtz, 47 years old. Parts of her body were discovered in November by fishermen in McKay Bay. The police couldn't identify her because she was chopped into pieces. They had to post a picture of a tattoo on one of the body parts, which was ultimately identified by Stephanie's family. Investigators learned Stephanie had been living with Robert Kessler. According to what Robert told investigators, they met at a McDonald's and he offered her a place to stay at his house, but he denied having anything to do with her death. He told police he'd previously asked her to leave and didn't know where she went, yet they found her blood all over his house. Police believe he killed her, chopped her body up, and then dumped it in the bay, but they haven't been able to come up with a motive for the evil killing. What we do know is that Robert Kessler has been a criminal all his life. He's faced criminal charges on at least 40 occasions since 1986. He's also been in prison at least four times. You have to be a real sick person to invite a desperate woman to your home as a safe place to stay, only to cut her up into pieces. Number 8. Family Massacre In March of 1992, a brutal triple murder was discovered in the Texas city of Kerrville. The victims were Clayton Kenny, his wife Juliana Kenny, and her daughter Adrienne Arnaud. All of them were found beaten and stabbed. The murders had taken place as the family was eating their dinner. There was a bloody knife on the table. Juliana still had a spoon in her hand, and there was blood all over the food from where their throats had been slit. It was terrible but the cops didn't immediately know what happened. There was no sign of forced entry. There were blood tracks on the carpet, and there were car tracks outside from where the killer had parked. The only thing of value missing was a rare spoon collection. The man investigating the killings was Joe Davis of the Texas Rangers. He believed somebody had a grudge against the family, but he didn't know who. He and his team looked at several suspects, but couldn't get enough evidence against any of them. Three weeks into the case, they discovered a fingerprint, but they didn't get any matches. It was nearly a year later that they got a tip over the phone, suggesting a man named James Steiner was responsible. He was at the local state hospital seeking mental health treatment. According to the phone call, he had admitted to one of the employees that he had recently killed three people. Investigators learned Clayton had hired him a year earlier to take care of his wife one weekend at their house. The police went and arrested him, and he admitted to murdering the entire family because he needed money for drugs. Yet all he got away with was a measly $25, which he used to buy some pot. The spoons had turned out to be useless. In the end, this evil man was sentenced to death and killed in 2003 by lethal injection.
Number 7. The Deranged Pianist Zachary Hughes may have gone to the most prestigious music school in the nation, but even with all his talent, he still turned out to be an evil villain. He was a concert pianist who once said he was on a mission to fill the world with music, but that mission ended abruptly when he stabbed a woman to death in South Carolina. Zachary was only 29 years old when he went to the dark side. His victim was a 41-year-old veterinary technician named Christina Parcell, who loved puppies. Her corpse was discovered in her home in Greer on October 15th, two days after she was killed. She was found with several sharp force injuries. Zachary had butchered her like a monster. But this case involves several bad characters, and it's actually rather confusing. Christina's fiancé, Bradley Post, was arrested before her death on charges of third-degree exploitation of a minor. This was a very bad dude who was found with extremely inappropriate videos of minors in his possession. He had produced the material himself on at least five instances for redistribution. As of right now, police have no idea where Zachary fits into all of this. We have a predator who was supposed to be married to Christina, and then a trained musician who spent his spare time dressing up like the Lord of the Rings characters accused of murder. Then there's Bradley's friend, John Mello, who was his accomplice in distributing the illegal videos. It's unclear whether Christina knew about any of this, or if Zachary was connected to the two perverts. What do you think is going on in this case? How are all these evil men connected to a seemingly innocent veterinarian? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to hit subscribe before the end of the video. Number 6. Severing Ties In the southwestern city of Avaz in Iran, Mona Haydari was decapitated by her husband and her brother-in-law in a case that shocked the whole country. But it gets even more shocking. A viral video swept across the internet of Mona's husband holding his 17-year-old wife's head in the street. He allegedly discovered she had been cheating on him, and so he cut off her head and showed it to the entire world. Iranian police officers have arrested two men in connection with the killing. Iran's vice president for women's affairs has called on parliament to take drastic, urgent measures to raise awareness of this kind of spousal abuse. In fact, it erupted the whole country with people demanding social and legal reforms. Obviously, there's something very wrong when a man can cut the head of his wife and then display it proudly like a trophy in the street. This guy is still living in 1327. Still, nothing changed the fact that this was an evil act perpetrated by an evil man with the help of his evil brother. Number 5. Jealous and Evil Michael Rawl really thought he could get away with killing his ex-partner by convincing the police she stabbed herself in the back. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. Michael attacked his ex-girlfriend Charlotte Huggins at her aunt's house in East London on January 1st. Just days before the attack, Charlotte had an extremely disturbing incident with the man. She accused him of being a lunatic and holding a knife to her stomach. The Crown Prosecution Service is now saying this was no freak accident but a deliberate attack by a deranged and jealous man. On New Year's Eve, Charlotte went to a bar to celebrate. She went home with a friend at around 2 o'clock in the morning. That was when Michael showed up. When he saw Charlotte with another man, he blew up in a fit of rage. He plunged a knife into her back, killing her right there on the spot. And to try to shrug the blame off, when the police arrested him, he said she did it herself. Not for a second did the police believe him, Michael has since been charged with murder. Number 4. A Deal with the Devil Daniel Hussein was 19 years old when he attacked Nicole Smallman and Bibba Henry as they walked through a park in London, England. He stabbed Bibba 8 times and Nicole 28 times. They were out celebrating Bibba's birthday and had decided to take a shortcut through the Friant Country Park. Neither had ever imagined in the wildest dreams they would be confronted by a maniac with a knife. Anyone who does this kind of thing is obviously evil, but Daniel was a special kind of evil. According to prosecutors, he killed the women as sacrifices so that he could win the lottery. He had made a deal with a demon in his own mind that if he sacrificed women to please it, that demon would let him win the lottery and let him get away with murder. 
when he was apprehended by the police, they found that he had purchased several lottery tickets right before the killings. They also discovered a bunch of lottery tickets throughout his room. It's a really good thing the police caught Danielle when they did. He admitted his intentions to sacrifice six women every six months until he eventually won the Mega Million Super Jackpot. It's a tragedy that he even made it to two, but at least he didn't make it to six. Number 3. A Date with the Devil From a deal with the devil to a date with the devil. Katie Locke lived with her parents in England when she was 23 years old. She was described by friends and family as a generous person who loved life. She loved life so much that she was trying to meet someone to share her days with, using the site Plenty of Fish. She met a man named Carl Langdell, who took Katie back to his room at a greasy motel in the early hours of Christmas Eve and strangled her to death. As a 2015 Christmas gift to himself, Carl took Katie's life and left her body in a bush near the hotel grounds. There was no rhyme or reason behind this attack, as seems to be common with murders committed by evil men. Katie was a confident and fearless woman who was working as a history teacher at a school in London. Carl, on the other hand, was examined by a forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Philip Joseph, and deemed emotionally unstable. He was also found to have psychopathic disorders. The pathologist in the case, Charlotte Randall, determined the cause of death to be compression of the neck. But at the inquest, Charlotte added that the attack was long and accompanied by extreme sexual violence. Katie didn't die immediately, but was slowly strangled by her killer. Carl was given a minimum term of 26 years in June of 2016. Shortly after, he was found in Wakefield Maximum Security Prison with his throat slit. Number 2. New York Strangler In 1993, a man in New York strangled a teenager to death with her own bra. She was just 17 years old, an innocent child who was murdered by the evil Joseph Belstadt. The tragedy occurred on the 19th of September when two witnesses saw Mandy Steingasser get in Joseph's car. It was the last time she was ever seen alive. One month later, her decomposed corpse was found in a ravine. She had been strangled to death although she also showed signs of a skull fracture from being beaten. Police found DNA evidence in Joseph's car, but they couldn't actually identify the DNA belonging to Mandy. Not until 2017. It took 28 years for Joseph to be brought to justice, finally found guilty and sentenced to 25 years to life. When he was found guilty in court, Joseph denied it through his teeth. He said he didn't kill her, he would never have done such a thing, and that they got the wrong guy. Because of his denial, we never did get a proper confession or admission of guilt, or even a motive. We still don't know why he strangled a poor teenager with her own bra and then dumped her body. Number 1. Indiscriminate Evil Brianna Kupfer was the victim of indiscriminate evil. At 24 years old, Brianna was working at a luxury furniture store in Los Angeles. On January 13th, a man named Sean Laval Smith walked into Croft House where Brianna was doing a shift by herself. She had never seen this man before, but she didn't like the look of him. She messaged a friend and said a man was in the store making her feel uncomfortable. Moments later, Sean walked up and stabbed her. He then walked casually out of the store and went along with his business. It wasn't until about 20 minutes later that a customer came in off the street and found Brianna lying in a puddle of her own blood. Her killer was apprehended 15 miles away in Pasadena. He has since been charged with murder, but he never was able to come up with a logical motive. According to the police, it was a completely random killing. This guy woke up in the morning and decided he was going to stab someone to death. It doesn't get much more evil than that. Number 10. Road Rage Police charged 18-year-old Jaden Michael Arduin with first-degree murder for shooting Wade Edward Smith and added another charge of attempted first-degree murder for injuring James Preston Allen Vaughan. This happened around 7.30 p.m. on February 15th this year, 2022. Authorities were called to the 9,000 block of the Louisiana Interstate 105 in Melville, Louisiana after people reported gunshots being fired. 
They also noticed the authorities of a blazing vehicle near the gunshots. The incident occurred near a gas station, where Smith and Vaughn were regular customers. The duo occasionally tried to hit on Arduin's girlfriend, who worked at the gas station. The girlfriend asked Smith and Vaughn to back off and stop flirting, because she knew that her boyfriend Arduin was reeling with jealousy. A few minutes later, Arduin entered the gas station with another person, and was visibly upset at seeing Smith and Vaughn. The same evening, while Smith and Vaughn were cruising down the interstate, Arduin wasted no time in chasing after them with a gun. One bullet caught Smith, who was driving the car, in the back. Vaughn tried to take control of the vehicle from the passenger seat, but lost control and rammed into a nearby tree. The car instantly went up in flames. An unknown man helped Vaughn out, but they already shot and burned Smith to death. They have not identified or charged the person helping Arduin. Police expect more arrests. While the investigation is underway, they're holding Arduin behind bars without bond. Number 9. Rekindled Relationship On August 23, 2013, in Bakersfield, California, police charged Leslie Jenea Chance with murder. An elementary school principal shot her husband of 17 years, Todd Chance, twice. This came as a shock for people who knew her, as she worked for the school district for 16 years. Leslie was first arrested because authorities suspected she was involved in the murder after the shooting, but they soon released her. Three years later in 2016, they arrested her again and charged her with first-degree murder. According to the county sheriff's office, the investigation was extensive as they looked at every angle and reviewed the documents. They even received help from the FBI. According to court documents, Chance had killed her husband for financial gain. But when they went to trial, they found Chance was flirting with his ex fiance The prosecution argued that Chance had killed Todd because he had an affair with his ex fiance and also for financial gain. The jury in January 2020 found Chance guilty of killing her husband, but not for financial gain. The prosecutors revealed Todd and his ex fiance Carrie Williams flirty text. Todd had asked Carrie for a good pic, and he had received nude photos of her. Chance and Williams had also been poking fun at Leslie. Williams also testified during the trial and spoke about her husband's rekindled relationship. This was all the evidence needed to arrest Leslie Chance, who they sentenced to jail for 50 years. Judge Bremer stated, no one has won, but justice has been served. Number 8. Improper Imposter On April 18, 2020, they charged Tanju Akar, a 32-year-old man in Mughla province, Turkey, with murdering his 25-year-old wife, Selvan Akar. The couple were married for many years and had two children, but they weren't happy. Tanju was a wife's beater. After many years of putting up with his abuse, Selvin finally found the courage to apply for a divorce. The husband disagreed and threw a fit of rage. On December 8, 2020, after months of planning, Tanju stabbed his wife. The knife went straight through her heart and killed Selvin on the spot. Upon confrontation, the perpetrator admitted to the murder and claimed that his wife Selvin had been having an affair. After his arrest, Tanju bragged about the various conspiracies he had concocted to fool the police. The evidence that his wife Selvin was having an affair was all made up by Tanju, which reveals that he intended to kill his wife. He had looked on the net for different ways to kill his wife and cover up the crime. Through a search, he found out that they consider a scammer an essential mitigating factor under Turkish law. Tanju had planned the crime so well that he created fake accounts and sent love messages to his wife, posing as someone else. For his devious plan and execution, Tanju faced the highest penalty charge under the country's legal framework, a life sentence. Number 7. Deadly Doubt Family members found Belinda Hernandez, a 53-year-old woman, dead in her home in Perlin, Texas. Family members immediately informed the authorities upon finding her lifeless body. The cops issued an arrest warrant for her 56-year-old husband, Houston Police Sergeant Hilaria Hernandez. The couple's daughter revealed in court that she, her husband, and her mother were drinking at her parents' place. Her dad, Hilario, suspected Belinda to be fooling around with a male friend, which had set him off beyond measure. Later that night, when the couple's daughter texted her mom to inform her that she had reached home safely, she did not receive any reply. Her mother was not someone who would ignore any calls or messages. The worried daughter persistently attempted to call her mom when finally her dad received the call. He yelled out that his wife was fine and quickly hung up. This did not convince the daughter, 
so she and her husband returned to her parents' home, where they found Belinda lying face down in the kitchen with multiple gunshot wounds. Hours later, they busted Hilaria Hernandez about 100 miles north of the Mexican border at a Kingsville hotel. A Houston police spokeswoman confirmed Hernandez was a member of the force. The police are looking for surveillance footage to establish more details of the case, Perlin police spokesman Jason Wells told the Chronicle. Number 6. Driven by Jealousy In Flatbush, Brooklyn, Kadeem Wilkinson stabbed 26-year-old Dwight Braithwaite after a fight inside a fried chicken restaurant in the winter of 2013. According to prosecutors, Kadeem stabbed Braithwaite, a random customer at the restaurant, because he was flirting with his girlfriend while dining at the restaurant. Wilkinson could spend up to 25 years behind bars for the alleged crime, triggered by uncontrolled passion. The defendant, his girlfriend, and a stranger, Dwight Braithwaite, were dining at a Chicken Express at 1341 Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, when things suddenly took a wrong turn. After leaving the restaurant, Wilkinson confronted Braithwaite for getting a bit too frisky with his girlfriend a few moments earlier. The argument soon escalated into a brawl just outside the restaurant. Wilkinson broke off from the argument, ran home to grab a knife, returned, and stabbed the victim in his back at around 12.45 a.m. Surveillance video captured when Wilkinson darted in and out of his house on that fateful night. Street cameras recorded the moment he stabbed Braithwaite, who was walking home too. The girlfriend in question testified against Wilkinson and confirmed that he had admitted to stabbing Braithwaite out of jealousy. Number 5. Killer Duo A 42-year-old Mason man stabbed another man to death for allegedly flirting with his girlfriend. Court documents say Jesse Dakins attacked 34-year-old Joseph Treviso after Treviso got a bit too comfortable with Dakins' girlfriend, 34-year-old Tiffany Warren. Dakins fatally stabbed Treviso in the living room of Warren's Mesa apartment. Court records reveal Treviso had mental disabilities and Dakins was his caretaker. After the dreadful deed, Dakins wrapped Treviso in a butterfly print shower curtain and dragged his body out to Warren's car. Dakins and Warren tidied up the place and swept the floors clean before driving off to Star Valley near Payson, where they got rid of the body. The story, however, doesn't end there. The couple's car broke down on the way back, and so they stole a van from Dakins' ex-employer. They then fled to Wisconsin, where Dakins once lived. Somewhere near the state border, the winds of the police pulled them over and arrested them on suspicion of vehicle theft. Out of fear, Warren confessed to all the events that led to the vehicle theft. Dakins later led the police deep into the forest, where they had hidden Trevezio's body. Police said the killer duo admitted to being under the influence of meth when executing the brutal murder. They charged Warren and Dakins with first-degree murder, abuse of a vulnerable adult, theft of means of transportation, and tampering with evidence. Number 4. The Revenge A simple flirtation on a bus led to cold-blooded murder in Brooklyn. Michael Gary, a Supreme Court judge, brought down a life sentence on Lawrence Jones for the killing of an 18-year-old Isaiah Roberts. They tricked the teen into going to a location in Brooklyn's Bed-Stuy section out of revenge for flirting with Jones's wife. The woman's husband, Jones, and Roberts, an immigrant eager to become an architect, got into an argument. When Jones pulled a gun on Roberts, he desperately tried to run away. Out of the five rounds shot at Roberts, one caught him in his back. A 2012 report claims he hid the murder weapon in the woman's purse. They found Roberts unconscious in Howard, and they later confirmed his death at King's County Hospital. Jones, however, maintained his stance of being innocent throughout the trial, but that did not deter the judge from sentencing him to 20 years in prison. Number 3. Double Trouble According to prosecutors, on the night of June 6, 2016, David White's girlfriend was driving him and her cousin Fatima Mohamed home in her minivan. Mohammed jokingly teased White's girlfriend that he had been flirting with her. This absurd assertion threw White off guard, and he shot Mohammed in the head in a fit of rage. That was not all. He even threatened to kill his girlfriend if she tried to run away. The terrified girlfriend drove to White's sister's house, where White collected material to dispose of Mohammed's body. He threw a plastic bag over Mohammed's head, and then shoved his body into a laundry bag. He then tried to conceal the crime by hiding the body in a closet and later cutting out the bloodstained floor mat of the minivan. He then drove to 60th Street and Aberdeen Avenue and hid Mohammed's body behind a vacant house. White's girlfriend wanted to stay as far away from possible from the demented man, 
A few days later, she confided in her sister and the Duluth police regarding the gruesome killing. It was then that they found Muhammad's body in the exact location disclosed by the girlfriend. At around the same time, someone dropped off a substantial piece of evidence at the police headquarters. The unnamed person turned over a 22 caliber handgun and a handwritten note. The note was an open letter written by White confessing to his crime. The handwriting analysis and the blood samples taken from the minivan were all the proof needed to charge White with Muhammad's murder. A few months later, as the trial was in progress, West Fargo police were called to the home where White was then living with his girlfriend. It wasn't for any routine or because White missed his hearing. This time, he had shot his girlfriend in the face. According to prosecutors and North Dakota court records, they sentenced White to 20 years in prison for the dull murder of his girlfriend and her cousin. Number 2. Pierced Through the Heart In September 2019, 26-year-old Siobhan Collins Grant brutally attacked Shakira Losik in Chalk Farm, North London. The fatal stabbing comes after a series of rows the two women had since the day they met at the nightclub a few weeks back. She stabbed Losik with a knife right through her heart. The 22-year-old died as doctors performed an open-heart surgery right in the middle of the street. The cause of death was determined to be because of cardiorespiratory failure resulting from blood loss. A whiff of jealousy sparked the entire ordeal. The Crown Prosecution Service revealed Losig was not happy with Grant's advances towards her girlfriend, Savannah. Days after the altercation at the nightclub, Grant was making pit stops at different friends' homes after her eviction from the hostel she stayed in. On September 8th, they asked her to leave the current house for talking behind the owner's back and sleeping with another friend's boyfriend. When she returned to Belmont Street to pick up her belongings with four of her friends, she found Losig waiting with a bunch of her friends and some of them had knives. Alarmed and without a moment's notice, Grant lunged towards Lucy with a knife of her own, screamed out her name, and drove it into the unsuspecting woman's chest. Grant fled the scene, but they heard her say, what have I done, before she tried to dispose of the murder weapon in a nearby canal. Grant pleaded guilty on the fourth day of her trial, and they sentenced her with a jail term of eight years. Number one, the last betrayal. A 23-year-old was distressed so much that she took the extreme steps months after breaking up with her boyfriend. A chance meeting at the University of Huddersfield had almost instantly sparked a romance between the two. A few months in, Emily Elliott of Huddersfield, in February 2020, discovered that her boyfriend, Shay Doyle, was cheating on her. Elliott realized she was being played, and that Doyle had two-timed her with another woman on Facebook. The pair had even blocked each other on all social media platforms. That's when the broken woman couldn't stand the betrayal and tried taking her life. She recovered and gave the relationship another chance. By now, the boyfriend had moved to Wilmslow. Doyle believed things were now sorted. He said, things are going well. We talked about having children together. Although everything looked fine from the outside, we cannot deny that the couple had a turbulent relationship. Several months after the initial confrontation, Doyle found Emily dead at her residence. Here's how things played out. On June 27, 2020, Doyle was worried when Emily did not respond to his calls or messages. He tried reaching out to her best friend, Kimberly Knight, who said she had received some weird messages from Emily. Doyle immediately sent something fishy and boarded the train to Hartfield. Once there, he took a cab to Emily's home. A visibly emotional Doyle said at the court hearing, I went upstairs, and Emily's bedroom door was closed. He opened the door to find Emily unconscious. He immediately dialed the emergency services and attempted to perform CPR until the paramedics arrived. But Emily was long gone. At the hearing, based on Emily's long story of mental health issues, previous attempts at overdosing and heavy drinking, they concluded that she had committed suicide and there was no foul play involved. Number 9. Jennifer Denyu. A 34-year-old former New York State trooper named Jennifer Denyu found herself in embarrassingly hot water last year when she became entangled in a catfishing scandal that made news headlines and ended her career. Things looked promising for the woman when she graduated from her law enforcement training in 2016 and drove right into her new line of work. But she veered down a wayward path in 2018 when she posed as a man online and began an online relationship with a 33-year-old woman living on Long Island. They corresponded for three months, during which time the victim sent nude photos of herself to Denyu. 
the ex-cop threatened to post the nudes online if the woman didn't travel to New York City to buy a fake ID for her. An investigation led to Danu's arrest for this and other similar incidents. She was also charged in Rome, New York for using various false identities to harass another woman for more than 15 years after they graduated from the same high school. The case out of Rome was ultimately dismissed and sealed, but the charges stemming out of Long Island stuck. Danu resigned from her job earlier this year, and she was sentenced to three years of probation. Number 8. Susanna Birch by the time she was 27, Susanna Birch had spent 12 years in a relationship with someone she never met in person. She met the man she knew as Richard in a chat room when she was just 15 years old. He claimed that he was 17 and that he lived in another part of the state roughly eight hours away from Susanna. The two hit it off pretty quickly based on their shared interests and spent hours at a time talking. But there were things about Richard that didn't add up. His promises to meet up with his online girlfriend never came to fruitation and he never video chatted with Susanna. He told her that his parents were overprotective, and for a number of years, it was a believable excuse. The couple continued their long distance romance and even got engaged after Susanna turned 18. Nine more years of breaking up, getting back together, and frequent arguments went by before the young woman saw the TV show Catfish and decided that she deserves some long-awaited answers about the man she's been involved with for nearly half her life. Truth be told, Susanna had suspected for years that Richard wasn't being completely honest with her, and she was finally ready to face the issue head on. She sought the help of a service that specialized in identifying catfishes and detailed the experience in an article she wrote for SBS News. The hired investigators quickly connected Richard's information to a Facebook account belonging to a married 60-year-old named Patrick. The next time he called, Susanna confronted him. At first, Patrick denied the catfishing, but he apparently realized that he was in a hole too deep to dig himself out of with more excuses and simply told Susanna, in his own words, that it just grew and grew out of control. He then unloaded about his drinking and marital problems, which had the effect of turning the tables and making Susanna feel guilty. Realizing she was being manipulated once again, she said goodbye to Patrick one final time, hung up the phone, and moved on with her life. Number 7. Keegan Anthony Klein In a pair of tragedies that became known as the Delphi Murders, the lifeless bodies of teenagers Abigail Williams and Liberty German were found in Delphi, Indiana in 2017. The girls' remains were discovered along the same hiking trail they had vanished from the day before. Police have not released details of how the teens were killed, and there have been no arrests in the baffling case. For quite some time, detectives failed to identify a suspect or even a person of interest. Their investigation eventually led them to a 27-year-old man from Peru, Indiana, named Keegan Anthony Klein. He had created a fake Instagram profile under the username Anthony Shots, using photos of a fit young male model. The social media user was the last person to have any contact with the girls before they were murdered. By the time police began to suspect Klein in the case, he was already awaiting trial for 30 other alleged crimes relating to child pornography and soliciting minors for sex. He admitted to using the Anthony Shots profile to solicit sexually explicit photos of young girls, but he adamantly denied being the Delphi killer. Unfortunately for now, the murderer remains at large, but the findings seem promising and offer new hope to a case that has otherwise hit a discouraging standstill. Number 6. Mariah Johnson Mariah Johnson grew up going back and forth between Washington State and Colorado. After high school, she joined the U.S. Air Force and got an astrophysics degree. She spent several years at an Air Force base in Colorado before ending up in Alamogordo, New Mexico, where she's currently stationed. Things took an unexpected turn for Johnson when her Instagram account was hacked during her late teens. Catfishers began using her photos and identity to scam unsuspecting love interests out of thousands of dollars over the internet. She believes that her uniform made her especially susceptible to the widespread fraud because people tend to hold military members in high regard. Myra told the Las Cruces Sun News that the impersonation has put her in the craziest situations. She said that people have messaged her accusing her of stealing their money. Based on what the victims have told Johnson, the scammers pretending to be her say that she's currently deployed and needs money. Myra noticed that social media users over a certain age seem more vulnerable to these scams because they don't realize that every account they come across is real. She's been dealing with this for years now, and while the use of her photos was admittedly slightly flattering at first, it caused more problems for the soldier than anything. For example, when she arrived at her current base, 
Her supervisor told her that he couldn't figure out which of the 20 Facebook accounts that appeared in a search using her name and photos belonged to her. Things got even more suspicious when a scammer pretending to be Johnson included a link to an adult website in the fake profile. But to Myra's surprise, authorities were unable to do anything about it. They told her that she has no options for legal recourse and that her best bet was to make people aware that people were impersonating her online. She tried filing complaints on social media websites, but her concerns eventually fell on deaf ears and nothing was done about the fake profiles. So for now, she continues to deal with it. As a rising influencer with more than 13,000 followers, it's probably safe to assume that it's becoming easier to get the word out. Number five, Renee Marsden. Teresa and Mark Martin's lives were forever changed by tragedy in 2013 when they received a text message from their 20-year-old daughter, Renee, saying that she loved her parents and apologizing for what she was about to do. Just hours later, the young woman, who worked in Sydney, Australia as a hairdresser, took her own life. Less than two years earlier, she had started communicating online with a man named Brayden, whom she was introduced to by her best friend. The two exchanged tens of thousands of text messages, and Renee grew to believe that Brayden was her future husband. Just months after they began talking, Brayden said that he was going to jail on a manslaughter charge after getting into an accident that killed one of his friends. Renee vowed to stand by her man, and they even looked into whether they could travel internationally for their honeymoon with Brayden's criminal record. But he abruptly ended the relationship one day in 2013, leaving Renee so heartbroken that she committed suicide. It soon came to light that she was never communicating with a real person in the first place, but that her best friend, Camila, the one who introduced the pair, had catfished her for 18 months straight. Before the truth was exposed, Camila had attended the memorials in Renee's honor and stood alongside the deceased young woman's grieving family, playing up the role of a mourning best friend. Renee's family later recalled that Camila was bizarrely obsessed with Renee and seemed to have developed a romantic interest in her at some point. They believe that Camila created the fake Brayden identity when she realized that Renee did not feel the same way. While Camila's actions were reprehensible, they technically weren't against the law, and she never faced criminal charges. The tragedy has prompted campaigns for catfishing to be made illegal in Australia, so that in the future, perpetrators of this potentially deadly deception can be brought to justice. Number four, Tori Marshall. Writing for the Australian website Mamma Mia, Tori Marshall explained that she first created a Tinder account when she was 23, because the dating pool in her small town was, in her words, non-existent. She met a man named Stelios through the app in 2019 and immediately found him attractive. More importantly, she felt a strong emotional connection with him, unlike anything she'd ever experienced before. After chatting on Tinder for a while, the pair decided to move the conversation to more private platforms. Something didn't seem right when Stelios added Tori on Facebook Messenger, but she was unable to friend request him. She brought it up, and he said that he's been banned from using Facebook despite remaining active on Messenger. At the time, the excuse seemed plausible. It was only in hindsight that Tori would realize it was the first of many red flags that would follow. She nevertheless trusted Stelios fully and told him everything about her life, even after he started doing some things that made her uncomfortable, including asking her for intimate photos. His manipulation and charm were convincing enough to cause Tori to overlook these behaviors. Finally, they made plans to actually meet in person. Tori took time off work so that Stelios could spend a week at her house. When the day came, though, he messaged her and said that he was in town, but he wasn't going to meet up with her until she did what he asked. He was trying to get the young woman to send an explicit video for himself. Eager to finally meet, Tori reluctantly obliged. But as soon as she sent the video, Stelios dropped off the radar. He never showed up or spoke to her ever again leaving her to wonder who she had sent such personal and private content to. In her own words, Tori was left feeling disgusting, manipulated, and confused. Police looked into the matter and told her that Stelios wasn't a real person, but that the only way they could take legal action was if he shared her explicit video online. Thankfully, that hasn't happened, and hopefully, it never will. Number three, Andrew Wolf and Cray Strange. Andrew Wolf was an award-winning math teacher who was well-liked amongst his students at the private Springdale Chestnut Hill Academy in Philadelphia. 
but there may have been ulterior motives behind his friendliness, as locals learned last year when he was arrested for a catfishing scheme that involved enticing middle and high school age kids to send explicit photos and videos. Wolf is accused of co-conspiring with a 19-year-old man from Carthage, New York, named Cray Strange to carry out the sinister plot. Throughout 2020 and 2021, the pair allegedly persuaded young boys to produce lewd content by posing as teenage girls. According to federal prosecutors, Wolf gave one 13-year-old a $100 PlayStation gift card in exchange for explicit footage of himself. The school's head, Stephen Druggan, described the news as difficult and disturbing and reassured parents that the school had fully cooperated with law enforcement throughout the investigation. But he spoke too soon when he said that none of the hundreds of explicit images and videos found on Wolf's device were of children who attended the academy. As it turned out, some of the school students were, in fact, victimized as part of the sickening scheme. Wolf and Strange faced a mandatory minimum sentence of at least five years if found guilty. Number two, taunting teenagers. A group of unnamed teenagers from Melbourne, Australia, recently made headlines for allegedly using fake online dating accounts to lure and attack unsuspecting gay men who were looking for companionship. The repeated violence sparked a police investigation that led them to the youths who were accused of persuading their victims to meet at a park. Two of the targeted men suffered minor injuries and a third was left physically uninjured but endured homophobic verbal abuse. Police arrested five boys ages ranging 15 to 16 and a 19-year-old man in connection with the assaults. The suspects are all due back in court at a later date. A law enforcement spokesman made it clear that the department will not tolerate hate-motivated crimes and promised to continue acting swiftly in response to complaints about these types of things happening. And number one, Ezra Mayhew. 17-year-old Ezra Mayhew hasn't been seen or heard from since October 15th of last year when he was dropped off at his job in Silverton, Oregon. When his parents arrived to pick him up at the end of his shift, he was nowhere to be found. Authorities theorized that the teen had run away and tracked his movement from Silverton to Salem, then to Seattle, where Ezra's tail went cold. Investigators and family members suspect that he fell victim to a catfishing scam that may have landed him in serious danger but they have no way of knowing for sure. For now, the young man's disappearance remains a mystery. Detectives hope that anyone who may have information about his whereabouts come forward to assist in the ongoing investigation, which has left the Mayhew family feeling distraught and heartbroken. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be tricked into meeting up with someone who used fake photos in their dating profile or have your own photo stolen and used in a fake profile? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.